Man, the title of my sermon tonight is In Direct Action. In Direct Action. Action that is not happening directly by someone, but that's done indirectly. Now, what am I talking about? Well, look at your Bible there in John chapter 3, verse 22. It's a really important concept, and we're going to draw a lot of important conclusions from it. But look at John 3, 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So in that last sentence, what are the two things that Jesus did? He tarried with them and he baptized. Verse 23, And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So in verse 22, the Bible tells us that Jesus tarried and baptized. And then we have someone saying this about him in verse 26, the same baptizeth and all men come to him. It says that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Now flip over to chapter 4, verse 1. Because if you were reading along in John chapter 3 and you read that, you would think that Jesus is baptizing people because that's what it said twice, right? That Jesus baptized people. So you'd picture him going down into the water and dunking somebody underwater, right? But look what the Bible actually says in John 4, 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, look at verse 2, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So we have this little parenthesis to tell us that Jesus was not actually the one literally physically doing the baptizing. Jesus baptized not. His disciples were the ones that did the baptizing. But isn't it interesting that when Jesus' disciples baptize, the Bible calls that Jesus baptizing. Now, why is that? Because they are doing it in his name. They're doing it on his behalf. Okay. Now, there are many, many examples of this in the Bible. And when you're studying the Bible, it's important to understand this. Let me give you another really clear-cut, obvious example. We won't turn there for now. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite. This is the prophet speaking to David. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. So he's saying, David, you killed Uriah with the sword of the children of Ammon. So did David actually kill him? No, but by sending Uriah to his death to be killed by the Ammonites in a way he killed him through the Ammonites. You know, a famous person that most people have heard of is Charles Manson. And Charles Manson was convicted and given the death penalty. Now, of course, later it was commuted and so he just was in prison for decades and finally died there. But he was originally sentenced with the death penalty, although he didn't actually kill anyone himself. You know, he didn't actually go and do those Tate and LaBianca murders, but yet he was given the death penalty for those murders. Why? Because he's the one who sent the people to go do it. And by sending Tex Watson and all the other cult members to go do those murders, he was considered a murderer because of that indirect action. Even though he didn't do the action, he did it through someone else. Someone else was his agent, okay, that performed the act. Now go, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 3. So we see this very clearly, that Jesus himself baptized not. But is the Bible wrong in John chapter 3 to say Jesus baptized people? No, because anybody who's baptized under his ministry, you know, that's Jesus baptizing them. But not only that, I think God's trying to teach us something deeper there about the fact that truly, if you think about it, all of us were baptized by Jesus. You know, just as much as those people in John chapter 3 were baptized by Jesus, we could say the same thing. Because when I got baptized, I was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. And the name of the Son is Jesus. So I was baptized in the name of Jesus. So if someone asks, well, who baptized you? You know, because that's really important to figure out. Well, here's who baptized me, Jesus. 
And I think that we need to comprehend that so that we don't get off on this thing of, you know, well, I want to make sure I get baptized by a certain person or, you know, uh, I'm not sure if my baptism is valid because the person who baptized me turned out to be a bozo or whatever. Here's the thing about that. You know, there's no instance in Scripture of someone being re-baptized because of who baptized them. So there's, no, there's nothing in Scripture of, oh, you got baptized by the wrong person, you need to get baptized again. Now, we do have in Scripture a clear example in Acts chapter 19 of people who got rebaptized because they weren't saved when they got baptized. They were not saved back then, so they had to get baptized again after they're saved. So baptism needs to take place after salvation. Baptism needs to be in deep water, and baptism needs to be in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But who baptized you isn't relevant, and we don't want to get too caught up in that. And this is why I discourage it when people make a big deal like, well, I want to make sure Pastor Anderson is the one who baptizes me. Like sometimes I'll go to a preaching event or something, and it's like, well, I've, you know, I've got to be baptized by Pastor Anderson. I understand where people are coming from. You know, they admire me, they like me, they look up to me, and they think it'd be cool to be baptized by Pastor Anderson. But you know what? It's cool to be baptized by Jesus. And we don't want to lift people up too much. And this is warned about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where people are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. So that you wouldn't see it as I baptized in my own name. And, and, and he was warning about getting too caught up in who baptized you or who you're following. And obviously, look, we need to follow leaders. Okay, when, you know, when you go to a church, the pastor of the church, the leader, follow the leader. You know, this attitude today that says, well, I don't follow anybody. That's not a biblical attitude. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Be followers together of me. So on the one hand, we do want to be followers, we do want to follow men. We do want to follow leaders. We do want to follow preachers and teachers and parents and heroes of the faith, even female role models for the young ladies. Uh, everyone should be following uh, leaders and mentors and things like that. But here's the thing. You don't want to go overboard on that, though, and start hero worshiping and idolizing people and lifting them up too greatly. And so I think specifically... This thing of, well, we need to make sure that we get baptized by a certain person is exactly what he's warning against in 1 Corinthians 1. And if you start teaching this doctrine that it matters who baptized you, the slippery slope there is that then everybody's like, well, I just want to be safe. So I'm only going to be baptized by a certain, you know, and people demanding to be baptized by the pastor or demanding to be baptized by certain people. Now, at our church, what we practice is that, you know, we don't just have anybody baptizing. We only have people who've been ordained into the ministry baptizing. So we only have someone who's ordained as an evangelist or a deacon or a pastor or something of that nature do the baptizing. Now, there's no clear scripture on that, but we're basing that on the principle that when we study the Bible, that's who we see doing the baptizing. Okay, so we don't just have every random person doing baptisms. We do have ordained ministers doing baptisms, but, you know, we, I don't think it matters who that personality is, which one did. You know, the pastor who baptized me ended up, uh, you know, becoming liberal and, and, and someone that we didn't want to follow anymore eventually. You know, my, my baptism certificate had the NIV on it. So, you know, does that mean I need to get rebaptized now in the name of... The King James or something, you know? No. So, so you know, that's why I say, and, and I agree, and I understand that some of my preacher friends believe differently on this, and that's totally fine. I get where they're coming from. It's just this is my personal view on it because of the fact that when you're baptized, that person who actually physically dunks you under the water isn't really the relevant person. It's really a transaction between you and the Lord. It's as if Jesus is baptizing you. And basically that person is kind of standing in for Jesus because they're doing it in his name. That's what it means to do something in his name. I mean, look, what if there was a funeral of someone that I really loved and looked up to and they were really important to me, but I couldn't make the funeral for whatever reason? What if I sent maybe a, a family member or I sent a staff member or I sent a friend to go there in my name, right, to represent me and, and basically to be at that funeral to represent my presence there. Does everybody see what that, 
signifies. So that's what it means to do something in the name of, on behalf of. Or if I signed over some kind of a power of attorney to someone where they could act in my name, they can sign documents, they can make deals. Diplomats are sometimes given plenipotentiary power where they don't have to call home and ask, hey, is this agreement okay? Before cell phones, it, it could take weeks to get an answer. So ambassadors would be sent a thousand miles away with the power to make the deal. And they can make promises, they can do everything. And they're not doing it in their own name, though. They're doing it in the name of the king who's back home. So that's what in the name of means. So when you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that's the authority behind that baptism. That's the validity behind that baptism. So if you're wondering if your baptism is valid, look no further than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost to check the validity of that baptism. That's what I believe, and I think that this scripture is another indication of that, where we see people being baptized by Jesus, although he isn't physically the one who dunked them in the water. Obviously, I'm taking a symbolic application from that. The literal application is that Jesus is the head of that group, and when his followers do the baptisms, it's him baptizing, because it's his crew, right? Where did I have you turn? Ephesians 3? Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 9. It says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, watch this, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God created all things by Jesus Christ, is what the Bible says. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. So when it comes to the creation, if we said that God the Father created this world, that would be accurate. If I say, if somebody say, hey, the, the, the Bible, the, the word, the, excuse me, the world was created by God the Father, I would say amen. But is God the Father specifically, actually, literally the one who did the creating? No, it was Jesus who actually did the creating. Because the Father created all things by Jesus Christ. Okay, does everybody see what I'm saying? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Colossians 1, 14. In whom we have redemption, through his blood, if you're reading in King James, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. Talking about Jesus specifically, specifically the Son of God. It says, by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. All the invisible things. Folks, is there anything that Jesus didn't create? All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. There's not a thing that he didn't create, okay? God the Father is the creator as well, though, because obviously Jesus Christ is creating on his behalf. And, and a lot of times the Bible will talk about the Father doing something and it'll talk about Jesus doing something. And then here's what people will do. They'll mistakenly think, oh, well, Jesus and God the Father must be the same person. The name of God the Father must be Jesus, and then they reject the Trinity and get off on this, bo this bogus oneness teaching, the, where the oneness of God, where, the, where Jesus and God the Father are the same person. No, it's three persons, one God. Yeah. Trinity is three persons, one God. Yeah. That's why Jesus said, hey, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Right. Right. That's why he said, if I bear record of myself, my record's not true. The Father which sent me, he bears record of me. Hey, I didn't glorify myself. Hey, I didn't send myself. Look, if he actually did send himself, that would make him a liar. He did not send himself. He was sent by the Father. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Right, right. So we understand that Jesus and God the Father are not the same person. They're both God. There's one God that consists of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So that's who God is. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So obviously Jesus is just as much God as the Father is. The Holy Spirit is every bit as much deity. He's every bit as much God as Jesus or the Father. All three of them are deity. All three of them are divine, but they are not the same person. Okay, That's why Jesus can be on the cross saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
He didn't say, myself, myself, why have I forsaken me? That's not what he said. And so that's a, that's a false doctrine that denies the Trinity. It's very unbiblical, very easy to debunk. And so where their proof text will sometimes come from is just showing, well, over here it says the Father did it. Over here it says Jesus did it. Boom, must be the same person. Or, or conflating Jesus with the Holy Spirit, same thing. So you have to understand this idea of indirect action or of, of one person acting as an agent of someone else where God created all things by Jesus and so forth. Now, where did we leave off there in 1 Corinthians 1? Uh, all things visible and invisible. We're about halfway through verse 16. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, does that include angels? Absolutely, right? So the angels, spirits, things in heaven, things in earth, visible things, invisible things, eternal things, temporal things. <laughs> I mean, the Bible's being really clear here. Without him was not made anything that was made. Jesus is the creator of everything. So he's not just one of many created beings. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus has always existed. He is God. He is from everlasting. He's eternal. He's always been around. He's as eternal as God the Father. You know, before the world began, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost were already all in existence. And so it says, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now go over to Matthew chapter eight. Matthew chapter 8, let me show you how this could be relevant when you're reading your Bible to interpret things. If you understand this idea that sometimes when the Bible says that someone did something, they're not the one who literally did it, but it was actually someone else who did it on their behalf. And let me give you an illustration. Okay, let's say I want to give Charles a message, right? And let's say I sent my son and I said, hey, run down to the church building find Brother Charles and tell him X, Y, and Z, right? My son comes down here, he finds Charles, he tells him X, Y, and Z, okay? Would it be accurate for Charles to then turn around and say, hey, here's what Pastor Anderson told me? Right. Yeah. Yep. It'd be accurate, right? Yes. He could yep. say, Pastor Anderson told me this, this, and that. Now, even if we never actually conversed one with another, I told him that through my messenger, and that's what God is constantly doing. That's why sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it'll say, you know, the, the, and an angel is sent and speak. And when the angel comes, he'll use the first person sometimes. I this, I that, talking on behalf of God because he's delivering the message from God. And that's God telling you something. And here's the thing. Let's say someone gets up and reads the word of God to you. God told you that. You know, it's like, well, man wrote the Bible, or that, that's just what a man said. But if he's speaking the Word of God, then it's actually God that told yeah, you that. Good. Because of the fact that the messenger is irrelevant. He's expendable. He's replaceable. He's just the agent. Just like the person who baptized you isn't the most relevant person in that equation. The one who's relevant is the one who's being baptized and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost who's actually doing the baptism spiritually, even though physically someone else is doing it with their hands. So look at Matthew chapter 8. This is something that people would, would look at this and think that this is a contradiction in the Bible if they don't understand this concept. Look at Matthew 8 verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. And saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come into my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same 
hour. So everybody got the picture, right? He comes into Capernaum. The centurion comes to him. The centurion beseeches him. He says, I'll come and heal him. The centurion says, well, I'm not worthy that that's just come on my roof. Just speak the word. Jesus marvels at his faith, speaks the word. The servant's healed. Great story, right? Go, if you would, to Luke chapter 7, and let's see the same event from another perspective, written by Luke as opposed to being written by Matthew. Both God's word, both perfect, both accurate, both right, but notice the difference in the way it's explained in Luke chapter 7, verse 1. Now, when he had ended all his sayings, in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, watch this very carefully, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. So did this guy actually come and confront Jesus? He said, no, that's why I didn't do it myself. That's why I sent someone else. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, except last week when something almost just like this happened. <laughs> I mean, a week ago, something almost exactly like this happened, except it was a different centurion with a different sir, and he walked right up to me himself. That was the only difference. Is that what he said? No, he said, I've not found so great faith. This is the ultimate faith that I've found. You can't find that twice. You can't twice find the greatest faith ever. Obviously, this is almost verbatim the same story. I mean, it, it'd, be, it'd be silly to say, hey, this is two different things. Same town, same centurion, same sick servant, same statement about, hey, this is the best faith I found which there can only be one like that, okay? So it'd be crazy to think that these are two different stories in this case. Now, sometimes, obviously, the Bible does record similar stories, and you can tell they're not the same. You know, one of them is Jesus preaching up on a mountain, another one he's preaching down in a valley or whatever. You know, you can say, okay, it's two sermons. Or, for example, when the Bible gives us one of Jesus' sermons, how long do you think Jesus typically would preach for? You think he would just get up and preach for 10 minutes, five minutes? and then just turned over to the worship band. You know, when Jesus preached, people ran out of food. You know, people have been there three days listening to him preach. So obviously, yeah, sometimes we can, we can take different sermons from Jesus and realize, hey, these sermons are really similar, but they're different sermons. because, Or they're different parts of the same sermon. He preached for, say, two hours, and we've got here five minutes of it. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, how long would it take you to read the Sermon on the Mount in Scripture? I don't think he just got up and preached that five, 15 minutes. It's probably about 15 minutes, you know, to read Matthew 5 through 7. I doubt that he got up and preached for 15 minutes and sent everybody home. You know, the Bible's only giving us part of the sermon, okay? Because of the fact, otherwise the Bible, if you were to write down everything, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written, right? So it only gives us what that book gives us. But in a situation like this, this is clearly, obviously, for sure, the same event. Okay. But yet one of them clearly says, I didn't go myself. First, he sent the elders of the Jews to deliver the message. Second, he sent his friends to deliver the message. But here's the thing. Matthew records it as this. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. Is that accurate? Yes. Because the centurion came to him by means of his messenger, his agent. He sent someone to see Jesus and to speak to him, which is how he came to him. And he said that to him because he gave the message through the elders of the Jews, 
through his friends. And then when Jesus says, I'll come and heal him, that message is delivered back to him. And then when he gets close to the house, he says, well, don't come to the house. You don't need to come to the house to speak the word. Jesus never met this guy. This guy never met Jesus because if you read Luke, that is clear. What Matthew is doing is just explaining the story in a way that leaves that out because that's not relevant. Like if we read the story in Matthew, are we somehow missing out on the spiritual truth here? Because we didn't get this detail about how he didn't come himself. Does that take anything away from the story? Nothing at all. Okay, what it is that the different authors are choosing to include different details as they're led by the Holy Ghost. Why? Because each book has its own points to make. That's why when I see people, they want to chop up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and mix them all together into like a chronological gospel. And people have been trying to do this for centuries where they'll, they'll try to synthesize all four into one narrative. Folks, if God wanted it written that way, he would have just picked one guy and had him write it that way. It's four narratives on purpose. That's the way it should be left. Yeah. Matthew. Now, you can compare and, and learn things and, and compare Scripture with Scripture. But if you want to just actually enjoy the Word of God and just grasp the Word of God, the best way is to just read Matthew by itself, read Mark by itself, and get the context of the book, right? Because the book has a certain message. There's a message that Matthew has. And, you know, you'll hear people often explain these differences, how Matthew is portraying Jesus as the King of the Jews, and Mark is portraying him as a servant of God, and Luke is portraying him as the Son of Man and, and emphasizing his humanity, and John is portraying him as the Son of God and emphasizing the Trinity and Christ's deity and his divinity. And John emphasizes his preaching, more preaching in John than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all have their different emphasis, their different style. They emphasize and focus on different things. They put things in a different order sometimes. Everything is as it should be. It's what God wanted us to have. It's the way it should be laid out. And so it's not a contradiction when two people explain things differently. And you know, any kind of an investigator who interviews people would realize this, that two people could be at the same event, they could both tell the truth, they could both be accurate, but their testimonies are not going to be exactly the same. You know, for example, you're reading in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one of them says he has a scarlet robe, one of them says he has a purple robe, the other one says he has a gorgeous robe, and I've heard people get all hung up on, you know, was it scarlet or was it purple? It's like, are you some kind of an interior decorator or something? What do you care? Why do you care? Why does it matter? And here's the true story. It was obviously probably somewhere like halfway between scarlet and purple. And how many times could you look at something and say, you know, it's green, it's blue, it's turquoise, it's teal. You know, is this purple or violet or indigo? Or, you know, where exactly do you draw those lines? of what constitutes what's... But people, they, they, they strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, right? You know, I, I heard somebody say one time, you know, the cock actually crowed, you know, uh, five times, and Jesus... It, Peter denied the Lord six times, and, you know, he fed the 5,000 several times. It, it's like, come on. Just because things are slightly different, they're just like, they want to just jump on. It was a different event. So they've got... Peter denying Christ six times. No, he denied him three times. He did not deny him six times. That's stupid. All right? It's crazy. But, but it, it comes from this kind of pedantic way of reading the Bible and just looking at everything and trying to just overanalyze everything. And you can't see the forest for the trees of the spiritual message that we're trying to get across here that it really doesn't matter whether it was scarlet or purple. The whole point, though, is that it's some color that would be related to the blood of Christ, right? And whether that's crimson or scarlet, red, blue, or purple, those are all colors that come up when the tabernacle is being built. Those are all colors that come up throughout the Old Testament to signify blood. Blue, purple, red, scarlet, crimson. It doesn't matter. It's meaningless, okay? So you can't sit there and just get hung up on those kind of things. And, and, and when people just tell you, oh, the Bible's filled with contradictions, this is the kind of stuff they'll pull out, folks. Seriously. And, you know, I could do this all day. 
We could go through, and I've, I've sat and done, I, one time I went to a bookstore and there was some book written by an atheist, every contradiction in the Bible is in this book. It was like a little paperback. And I'm just going through, and I, I just started at the beginning, and I'm just going through them, and I, and I had an answer for everything. Because they're, the, you know, the stuff that they came up with is this kind of stuff, where they just don't understand what's going on. Or like, for example, where the, you know, uh, one of the Gospels will say, hey, at the, at the sixth hour, you know, Jesus is crying out on the cross and, 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 and he's making these utterances at the sixth. And then there's darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, right? But then when you're reading John at the sixth hour, he's not even on the cross yet. And he's saying, you know, behold the man. And, and Pilate is showing him to the Jews and they're yelling, crucify him. And you're just like, that's for sure a contradiction. No, it isn't. It's not a contradiction because it's two different clocks. Two different clocks. Because of the fact that when you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's from the Hebrew clock, which in the Jews' clock, the evening and the morning were the first day, and the day begins at 6 a.m., and there's 12 hours in the day. And when the Bible says the third hour, from the Jews' perspective, that would be around like 9 a.m. would be what they would consider the third hour. What would we consider the third hour? 3 a.m., right? So here's the thing. When John is saying the sixth hour, you know what it's talking about? Like we think of the sixth hour, 6 a.m. It's talking about in the morning. Whereas when the synoptics are saying six hour, they're talking like noon, right? That's their, because they're starting at dawn, six hours into the day. So that just goes to show you how you've got two different books written by two different authors, two different perspectives, saying two different things, and it's not a contradiction. They're both right. They're both correct. They're both accurate. They're just being written from a different perspective. And it's the same thing here. You know, Matthew, uh, and obviously, make no mistake, God is the author of the Bible. But God used human beings to write the Bible. And, and it, what's that? Indirect action. When we say God wrote the Bible, that illustrates exactly what I'm talking about this whole sermon. Right. Because did God actually take a pen and, and put it to paper? No. When we say God wrote the Bible, we all understand what? That he used his agent. He used his instrument. Someone else who actually wrote the Bible. People like Moses and people like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and even Jeremiah, you know, he's not actually the one who wrote Jeremiah. You know who actually wrote? Baruch is the one who actually pinned it down. And who wrote the book of Romans? We'd all say the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans. But who actually wrote it? Well, in Romans 16, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So in Romans chapter 16, Tertius, a guy that you've never even heard of, not only, he's not even of secondary importance. He's of tertiary importance. His name is Tertius. Why? Why is his name Tertius? Because number one, it was written by God. Number two, it's written by Paul. Number three, it's written by Tertius. All right, so that's why he's Tertius. He's, he's quite tertiary in this process. But nobody goes around and says the epistle of Tertius to the Romans. But you know what? That's just as silly as when people say man wrote the Bible. No, because God is the source of the truth in the Bible. God is the source because the word was in the beginning with God. The word was God. God is the author. But he used human beings to write it. And those human beings actually put a human element into the Bible. But yet, it's not of any private interpretation. They didn't put any kind of a slant on it or, well, you know, Paul was just a little bit negative toward women, so that's why. No, he is writing what God wanted him to write. It was all done by the will of God. It, the scriptures of old time came not by the will of man, but by the will of God, the Bible says. So it was God's way, not Paul's way. Not David's way, not Matthew's way, not Mark's way. It's God's way that the Bible was written. But it's still written by human beings. This is a great mystery, right? This is what's so interesting about the Bible. But isn't Jesus himself in that sense of mystery? Great is the mystery of godliness when you think about God being manifest in the flesh. How could Jesus be both human and divine? How could he be God and human at the same time, but yet he is, both God and 
human and great is that mystery of godliness. But here's the thing. The word of God is just like Jesus. The word of God is human. I mean, when you read the epistles of Paul, don't you feel like you know Paul a little bit? You get to know the man. And you think to yourself, you know what? I kind of know what Paul was like. I got a feel for his personality. And John's personality is not the same as Paul. Because if God were just writing the Bible without using a human instrument, wouldn't it all be the exact same style and the same personality? And you wouldn't even be able to tell Peter from Paul, from John, from Jude. But what we actually have is we have their personality coming through, but yet it's totally untainted, yet it's sinless. So just as Jesus, both human and divine, totally sinless while being human, the Bible is human, human authorship, but yet totally sinless, totally right, no error, nothing wrong, nothing. Now, we would look at the Bible sometimes and say, hey, I found something wrong in the Bible, but it's not wrong. You're misunderstanding it 100% of the time. If you find something in the Bible that you think it's wrong, it's just that you don't get it. And here's the thing. There have been many times in my life when I read something in the Bible and I thought, you know what? This seems like a contradiction. But you know what? By faith, I'm just going to believe that it's not because I believe that God's word is perfect. And then what happens is a few years go by and you learn a little more about the Bible and you're like, why did I think that was a contradiction? I was so ignorant. I just didn't know the context. I just didn't know. I hadn't compared scripture enough. You know, and there are all kinds of things like that. You know, when you think about the third day or something and you realize that there are different ways of expressing. If I say, hey, I'm going to come to your house on the third day, you wouldn't even know what day I'm coming on. Would you? In America in 2020, if you said, what day are you coming over to my house? On the third day. Okay, here we are. Today is Sunday. Coming to your house on the third day. You would, you would clarify that. Who would clarify it and say, okay, I want to make sure. What are we talking here? Are, are we starting counting? Are we counting today? Are we counting from tomorrow? What are we doing? And, and when we see the way the Bible counts, sometimes the Bible doesn't count the way that we count. Because, you know, when you're living in America, you're speaking English, it's going to be sometimes a little bit different. And, and I'm not saying that we need to go buy some history book to tell us about it. The Bible has internal evidence where you can just, you just study the Bible and you start getting a feel for things. Like, oh, I get it. When this says the, the third hour of the day, it, it's a, these men are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. You know, if it was 3 a.m., it wouldn't really be that weird for them to be drunk. The bar's just closed at 2, and they're stumbling out and speaking in tongues or whatever, you know. That's basically meaningless. But, but when we study our scripture, we'll understand, okay, the third hour is like 9 a.m. Then it makes sense. So, you know, you compare scripture with scripture, you figure these things out. But sometimes the Bible will say things like, for example, in the book of Esther, where, you know, she says, hey, we're going to fast for three days and three nights. And then on the third day, I'm going to go. So that means on the third day is after three days have gone by. Or like, for example, it talks about Elijah showing himself to King Ahab in the third year. But then when we study elsewhere, it tells us that it was three years and six months. So in the third year is in that third year, meaning like if it's been 3.1 years, 3.2 years, 3.3 years, three and a half years, that's all the considered the third year. And that makes sense because it's got three in front of it. But that's not how we would think of it. Like, for example, it's uh, two, 2020 right now. So what decade are we in? What decade are we in right now? What decade is this? Somebody help me. No, that's a century, folks. What decade are we in? Don't give me the right answer. I want the wrong answer. What decade are we in? Nobody wants to answer. Give me something. We're in the 20s, is what I wanted you to say, which is wrong. Say it. What decade are we in? 20s. No! <laughs> but here's the thing. Because technically, technically, you know, the, we're in the second decade, and then the, new, the third decade is going to start when? Next year. Because if you think about it, it's like the first 10 years. And the, but, but here's the thing. No, that's dumb. I say we're in the 20s. 
Amen? I'm just trying to confuse you as much as possible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but seriously, hey, if somebody asked me my opinion, I would say, hey, we're in the 20s right now. Okay, that's what I would say. But a lot of people would say, well, no, because it's like 18, 19, 20, that's still rounding out that series of 10. <laughs> Does everybody see what I'm saying? Yeah. The, what am I trying to say? There's different ways of looking at things. You know, if, if we're in America, on a hotel, the ground floor is called the first floor. Now, to me, anything else would be crazy. When you go upstairs, what floor are you on? The second floor. But if you go to Europe, the second floor is called the first floor. And they'll call it the ground floor. So basically, the ground floor is like floor zero to them. What in the world? We, we would think of upstairs as the second floor. They call it the first floor. They'd say, hey, I'm, I'm going to go up to my room on the first floor. Now, that's not how we think. So what I'm saying is when you read the Bible and you come to the third hour, the third day, you know what? It, there's an author's perspective there that could be meaning after three days, during the third day, things like that. Like, like what year of my life am I in? You know, so I'm 39 years old. So is this the 40th year of my life? Because I've already completed 39 full years. 39 years are done. So am I in my 40th year? If, so if, if the Bible were being written and wanted to mention me, and it said, in the 40th year of Pastor Anderson, or would it say in the 39th year because I'm 39 years old? Which one? Which one's right? The truth of the matter is, there isn't a right or wrong. You could say both. What if there was a book of the Chronicles of Tempe? And in the Chronicles of Tempe, we have a, a, a book that says, in the 39th year of Pastor Anderson, X, Y, and Z happened. And then over in the book of pastors, it says, in the 40th year. Would you say, oh, that's a contradiction? Or could both be correct, even though one says 39th and one says 40th? They could both be correct. Because it's just one author's looking at it one way, another author's looking at it another way. They're both right. Okay, and, and this is the kind of silly stuff that atheists would choke on and make a big deal about. And it's so funny because the Bible is such an amazing book on so many levels. Even unsaved people, even people who don't even claim the name of Christ, even atheists will acknowledge that it is a great, marvelous piece of literature, even if they don't believe in it. It's an amazing book. So you mean to tell me, and, and then they'll point out these dumb so-called contradictions. You mean to tell me that someone could put together a book this amazing, this awesome piece of literature, but then they just accidentally left out a name in a genealogy because they're just that clumsy. Or they just accidentally tagged on. It's like, come on. This marvelous masterpiece, and they just happened to leave three names out of a genealogy in a row. Folks, if those names are left out, they were left out on purpose. It's done on purpose because when the Bible is giving us a genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 and it says, hey, all the generations from this person to this person are 14 generations, it's just giving you an easy way to remember that list, 14, 14, 14. So what? But people get hung up on that. They miss the spiritual message. They miss Jesus dying on the cross. They miss the spiritual content because they're too busy trying to pick it apart and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So because they think they're smarter than the Bible and smarter than the holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, now all of a sudden they've found all the problems and all the contradictions and all the issues. And really, it turns out the joke's on them because everything in the Bible's right. 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 Amen. And they just didn't understand. You know, when you're going back and comparing the reign of this king and the reign of that king, here's what you have to understand. In real life, things aren't always so perfect and clear-cut of who's reigning and who's not. You know, a lot of times you'll have one guy's reigning and then another guy comes on board and is, is, is reigning as a co-regent. I've seen this in my lifetime many times in churches. The pastor's getting old, so he brings in the co-pastor. And he'll preach like once a week. The old gray-haired pastor preaches on Sunday morning and then on Sunday night and Wednesday night, the new guy's preaching. And they'll do that as like a transition for years. Who's ever experienced that in a church where you have the new guy being phased in? Well, guess what? Throughout history, that's the way it has been with kings as well. 
where, you know, the, the, the son who's going to take over, he gets brought in and they're reigning together. So then it's like, okay, when did this guy begin to reign? Two different authors, one of them could count when he started being the co-pastor. One of them counts when he's the actual top leader in the kingdom when he's actually the king. Does everybody see that? So there could be two different ways of looking at the same thing. Also, you know, in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. But here's the thing. What exactly does that mean? Because does it mean when Nebuchadnezzar became king or when Nebuchadnezzar actually was ruling over his empire? You know what I mean? You think of Alexander the Great being in power or Philip of Macedon being in power. What does that mean? Because is it when they just took control of their little region or is it when they actually reigned? Or is it when they reigned over Israel? Because that's the area that we actually care about. You could go on and on, folks. So the bottom line is, we, if you understand this, this idea of things being done indirectly sometimes, different perspectives, and so forth, you know, it'll help you understand the Bible. And ultimately, you just need to have faith that the Bible is true and not approach the Bible with, well, let me do the math and figure out if this is really true. Sometimes the Bible rounds off numbers, by the way. What about when the Bible says, hey, David reigned over here for 33 years. He reigned over here for seven and a half years. And so the total they reigned is 40 years. It's like, don't be all math, you know, geeked out and trying to say, well, that would be 40 and a half years. So what? It doesn't matter, folks. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about where you have to understand the Bible is rounding things off. The Bible's estimating numbers. The Bible is, you know, going to the nearest crayon in the pack, whether it's, you know, scarlet or purple. And it's just different perspectives. One last place I want to go, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9. So the title of the sermon is Indirect Action. You know, some actions in the Bible are done indirectly. So God creating the world by Jesus Christ. The centurion coming to Jesus by means of his emissaries, by means of his ambassadors, right? Jesus baptizing people by proxy. Jesus baptizing people because his disciples baptized people. And guess what? Today, the disciples of Jesus are still baptizing people and we're still actually being baptized by Jesus, if you think about it, because it's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But this can also be a negative thing. Look if you would at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You know, one last application I want to make about this is how about abortion? You know, what about when you promote and fund abortion? Doesn't that make you a murderer? Or what about when you go get an abortion? Doesn't that make you a murderer? Now, here's the, even if you're not the one who actually killed your baby, guess what? If you got an abortion, you're murdering your baby. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You're doing it indirectly through, you're having someone else do your dirty work by proxy. And let me tell you something, I would never, ever choose to vote for someone and knowingly vote for someone that I knew is pro-abortion. Right. Right. No matter what. Like, if they were right about everything... But I know that they want to promote abortion, fund abortion, be okay with abortion. You know, I can't in good conscience vote for that person, even if it is the lesser of two evils. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to be a partaker of that sin. I don't want to pay for that and promote that and push that through someone else. You know, it's really sad today how the United States of America takes our tax dollars and gives it to places like Planned Parenthood, and even, even sometimes spends money toward abortions in foreign countries. I mean, babies are being aborted in Africa from money that's sent from the United States. And to me, that's, that's America killing those babies. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if America is sending money over to Africa saying, hey, here's some money to an abortion organization, wouldn't you say America killed those babies? They paid for someone else to do it. Just like if I hired a hitman and they killed someone, I could be like Charles Manson, convicted of murder. Because I, or, or at least I was an accessory to murder. So therefore, 
you know, you need to make sure that you don't get involved in indirectly promoting things or funding things or, and I'm not saying not to pay taxes because, you know, the Bible tells us that we should pay taxes. And so I, that was directly addressed by Jesus, render unto Caesar. I pay taxes, but I'm not going to vote for those taxes to be spent on something wicked. And don't even, don't fall for this thing of, well, yeah, but that's only part of what Planned Parenthood does. And they, sometimes the, these politicians will say, well, hey, we're still going to give federal money to Planned Parenthood, but we're just going to say you can't use this money for abortion. How does that even work? It's like, it's like okay, so, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to use this 20. I don't want to use that money for abortion. I'm going to use this money for abortion. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I'm so confused. Because here's the thing. Let, let's say, let's say I, got, I got 40 bucks, right? And, and let's say, you know, it's going to cost, and I'm just using crazy numbers. Let's say I got 40 bucks here, right? And I'm, I'm going to do four abortions at $5 each, right? And I got $20 worth of expenses just to kind of keep the lights on, keep everybody paid, keep everything rolling, right? And if the government said, well, hey, we're going to give 20 bucks just to do everything else, right? And then let's say Planned Parenthood already had this 20 bucks. They already had this from somewhere else, from all the rabid, feminist, Satanist weirdos donating to them. So this is what they got from the rabid, Satanist weirdos, and this is what the federal government gave them, right? Well, here's the thing. What if the federal government didn't give them this? Are they going to be able to do the abortions? No, because this has got to go to keeping the lights on. They only got 20 bucks. They got 20 bucks of overhead. But then, now, when the government gives their $20 to go toward everything except abortion, now their overhead's covered, and they can say, score, now we can take all this, and it can just all go toward abortions. It is, does it really matter which 20 went toward it? That's, that's, but that's, people, the politicians just must think you're stupid. Right. Well, we're going to make sure none of our donate. It'd be like, what if you put your money in the offering plate, right? Let's say you put money in the offering plate. And I know somebody who used to do this. I'm not going to say who it was. I knew somebody who he would write down, when he put his money in the offering plate, he would write down exactly what he wanted it to go toward. You know, he said, I want it to go toward the power bill or whatever. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Do you think that if you put your money in the offering plate of Faithful Word and said, I want this to go toward the rent, make sure this goes toward the rent. You know what I'd say? Okay, I'll do that. I'll make sure it goes to the rent. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's going to go in our bank account. Right. And we're going to pay the rent. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, okay, okay, so you gave, don't cry, it's okay. But, you know, you gave us, you know, it's like, you gave us $300 and our rent's $10,000 a month or $11,000 a month, right? Because that's what our rent here is, eleven grand, because it's like 11,000 square feet. So, you know, okay, we're spending eleven grand on rent. You gave 200 bucks and said, hey, make sure this goes toward rent. okay. Or what if, you, what if you gave us the money and said, hey, make sure this doesn't go toward the rent? No problem, you know what I mean? Because we're going we're gonna to spend, and we could pretty much tell you, we could on paper say, oh, oh, hey, you know what? Your $200 went toward, it went toward Brother Corbin Russell's salary. Look at the great work he's doing. You know, oh, great. Well, I'm glad I was a part of that. You know, or we could say, hey, your $200 went toward those Bibles on the back shelf. Paying for, oh, great, Bibles. Psh. What could be more pure? The point is, it doesn't really make a difference, does it? Right. It's dumb. It's meaningless. It's just, a, it's just a game that they're playing with you. Okay. If you donate money to Planned Parenthood, you're donating to the murder of babies. Because that's, right. that's, that's what they are about. That's what they do. I don't care what part of it is what they do. Well, what percentage of murder did Charles Manson do? That's, that's only like 2% of what he did. <laughs> what about his music? You know? <laughs> His music was pretty rough. So, don't quit your day job, Charlie. So, anyway, indirect action, right? Understand it. Grasp what I'm saying so that you can understand the Bible 
and, and so that you don't let people play games with you, whether it's the politicians playing games with you, people trying to show you contradictions in the Bible playing games with you, uh, people denying the Trinity, trying to mess with you. Be not deceived. Let no man deceive you. W w why preach a sermon like this? You know, I'm trying to give you the tools so that you don't get deceived. Okay? So that people can't trick you and lie to you and so that you'll get it. When the oneness guy comes to you and tries to trick you, uh-uh. When the atheist tries to show you the contradictions of the Bible, nope. Not today, Satan, right? And when somebody tries to come at you with, oh, Planned Parenthood, you know, we're not donating to that wing of Planned Parenthood or whatever. It's the same bird, folks. And so be not deceived. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.